everyone, I'm Stephanie, and this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. I just have to say, I'm so excited for today's story. Today, I'm talking about an Italian American woman, Louise Asirno. Louise, she was a true hustler. She was involved in real estate, she owned a bell bond business, bootleg during the prohibition years and married whoever she wanted, even if it landed her in jail. But today is extra special because I have a guest host, my mom. Say hi, mom. Hello, everyone. I really love her podcast, but today I'm really excited about this episode. No, I'm super excited that you're here today, too. This this will be a fun episode to do. Um, And it's a Denver story. So you were born and raised in Denver and the Little Italy area. So she'll know quite a bit of this stuff. And We'll get into kind of how Louise is tied to our family, but we'll get into that later on because we want to focus on Louise. I found out about Louise one day when I was researching our family, and I'm sure I was on, you know, some newspaper database, and I saw a headline that said, Parents of Bride Spoiled Trip, Louise Prefers Gel to Home. And so it was just kind of an interesting headline. It grabbed my attention. And um, so I ended up I ended up going down a big rabbit hole researching Louise, and I quickly learned that she was Italian, and that made me want to research her even more. Uh, So I want to actually start off telling the story about Louise with that headline. And that headline, it was from the Denver Post, December 1919, and it has this amazing photo of Louise. She's got this huge smile and like this big floppy hat, and I think that was also one of the things that kind of attracted me to, to the newspaper, because I could tell she was Italian, and she just had this big, like smile on her face, even though the headline suggested she was going to jail. So apparently what happened was Luis was 16 when she eloped with her love, Angelo Laveo, and he was 26. They ran off to Golden, Colorado, which is a town west of Denver, and they were married by the Justice of Peace. After the ceremony, Luis and Angelo headed to the train station to go to West Virginia for their honeymoon. But their happy union was interrupted when her family came rushing into the train station. The paper said, quote, the appearance of six husky brothers and an irate mother and father at the Union Station yesterday afternoon put an end to the romance of Luis Asirno and Angelo Laveo. So obviously her family was not thrilled about this marriage and Luis, she refuses to go home with her family and she actually convinces the police to put her in jail or what they called that or what they called jail at that time was the matron's headquarters for women. And she told them that she prefers the solitude of jail to returning to her home without her husband. So she obviously wanted to marry him and her family was not having it. But what's really funny is during this whole encounter with her family, Angelo just took off. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, I guess I can't blame him too much for this. Six brothers and her parents come searching for her and he just eloped with her. He's 10 years older than her. I mean, he was probably a little scared, but it's just funny that he just abandons her and takes off. (laughs) So, but while Luis was in the matron's quarter, she actually told a reporter with the Denver Post that she loves Angelo and she told her mother that if they didn't let her have him in a nice way, she would run away and have him anyway. So, (laughs) so she went on to tell the reporter that, quote, It's all their fault. They liked Angelo all of the nine months he has been coming to see me until about three weeks ago. And if they had told me in a nice way, I couldn't have him until I was 18, I probably would have waited. You would have thought that they would have known what was going to come from that for nine months. (laughs) Exactly. It's like she's dating this guy for nine months. Like, she's probably going to end up marrying him. Yeah, that's a good point. It's like, just tell her, don't marry him or, you know... Yeah, it's like nine months is a long time. It's a long time. All of a sudden, say no. No, you can't do that. And we're talking 1919, so people got married at a lot younger. I mean, right? You think that they would have? (laughs) They should have saw that one coming. So I probably would. She so she said I probably would have waited, but they didn't. Sunday, my brother slapped me and embarrassed me in front of several people at the house by telling me I couldn't have that fellow coming to see me. I wanted to show them that I wanted that fellow and that I was game enough to run away and get him. (laughs) I mean, I'm not laughing that the fact that her brother slapped her. That's pretty bad. But man, she just, she didn't give one toot what they thought. She was, she was going. <laughs> and I bet the slap 
almost pushed her from more forward. Exactly. <laughs> She's probably like, oh, I'm definitely marrying him now if you're going to slap me. <laughs> so Luis, she went on to explain that her family didn't really like Angelo because he was too old for her and he had a previous wife, um, but she did pass away and he has two children from that marriage. So, I mean, I can see her family's point of view too. She's 16. He's 10 years older. He's got two kids. They probably thought maybe that you know, could create a little bit of hardship for her, especially in the 1900s. But then but, again, nine months, where did they think it was going to go? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, she's obviously, it wasn't like it was a two month courtship. I mean, nine months is a long time. Right. Like I said. And she knew the kids and she was still okay with it. So, and she told the reporter that they need a mother. And since she has helped bring up her sister's two babies, it was easy for her to take care of them. And she said she loves them. And that's all that matters. Well, that's kind of sweet. That shows she's got a big heart. Um, in the article, the reporter explains that Luis lives on a farm in Welby, which is a few miles away from Denver. And the reporter says, however, despite her age, she has, quote, a philosophy that would put many of her elders to shame. And I think the reporter thought highly of her for sticking to her guns and loving Angelo and his kids. And I, I'm not sure, but I think, I think the reporter was a woman. In fact, I think her name was Alice... Row or something like that. So she probably kind of was like, good for you, lady. Like, you stick to your guns. If you love this guy, you go marry him. <laughs> so the reporter closes the article by asking Louise how she was able to get away from her family and her home to meet Angelo and Golden and marry him. And Louisa answers him by apparently laughing and talking about how she told her sister, Teresa, that she wanted to go into town with her to buy some Christmas presents for the family. And when they got to town, Louisa, apparently she did buy a few of the Christmas gifts, but Angelo was actually waiting for her and they were able to escape and take off to Golden where they were married. And so she, she goes on to talk about how she doesn't really know how her family found out what was going on, but apparently they must have suspected something. I'm wondering if somebody maybe in the town heard a rumor about what Luis and Angela were gonna do and maybe told her family. But again, they apparently suspected something and found out that they were at the train station and they came in full force to drag her away from Angelo. And so that was the article that really made me fall in love with Luis. But let's, I wanna back up now and just start at the beginning of Luis's life and kind of talk about her parents and all of that stuff. So her parents, Angelo Raphael Asierno and Antonia Marino, were married in Potenza, Italy in 1881. Angelo, he was born in 1857, and Antonia, she was born in 1866. And I think I've mentioned this in a few episodes, um, because I've done, you know, a few on Denver, but a lot of Italians that settled in Denver came from Potenza, which is in the Basilicata region. In 1892, Angelo, he immigrated to Missouri and Antonia, she stayed in Italy so that Angelo could come and get settled in America. But apparently Angelo, he met another woman in Missouri and started another little relationship. And somehow Antonia, she heard about this. I don't know like how she how heard about it. Hear... Yeah. Like there's no social media. Right. <laughs> How did she hear about this? I don't know. Maybe she just picked it up. Maybe she could just tell, like, woman's intuition kind of thing. And <laughs> she knew maybe by, like, the way he was writing his letters or maybe he stopped writing well, her sure letters. I'm sure the mail is slow, too, back then. Oh, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. So probably, maybe he just quit writing her and she's like, oh, he's found another woman. <laughs> I've got to get to America. <laughs> and she did. She immediately left Italy and came to America. So she came to America. Marriage was good. They were fine, <laughs> continued growing their family. And actually, Antonia, she ended up giving birth to 21 children. That's bizarre. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Poor woman. I know, That's and this is in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, that's just, uh, Louise, who our story's about, she's the youngest and she was born in 1903. Wow. I know. So she started in the eight, late 1800s all the way up to 1903. <laughs> Pregnant for a lot of years. <laughs> like decades. <laughs> Two decades almost. <laughs> or a decade. It's insane. Um, and, you know, it was all at home, which, you know, a lot of people still do that today, but conditions were definitely different. But sadly, out of those 21 children, only 10 survived. And those children were Michael, Henry, Annie, Gerardo, Pasquale, Salvatore, Teresa, 
and Louisa. And like I said earlier, Louisa was the baby of the family. There was actually a really cool article that came out in the Rocky Mountain News dated December 29th, 1910. The reporter interviewed the Asierno family, but they primarily focused on Antonia and how she raises her children. And the headline is great. It reads, Denver woman, 46, is mother of 21. Last 10 are brought up like vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I know. <laughs> uh, so basically, the article focuses on how Antonia has changed the way she raises her kids, especially after 11 of them died. And Antonia, she really describes how she went back to her Italian ways with the 10 children who survived. The author, the author of the article, Alice Rowe, talks about how she really had to coax Antonia to talk with her. But she points out that she really wanted to interview Antonia because, quote, the mother of 21 children is an event of considerable importance. And apparently Antonia would talk about her vegetables with ease and little, quote, embarrassment, but it was harder for her to talk about her family. And um, she goes on to describe how Antonia raises numerous vegetables in her garden that she, and then she then takes them and sells them at the market. But her children that she raises are not for sale. <laughs> so Alice says, quote, this good-looking matronly Italian woman has given birth to 21 children, and Antonia told her that her bambinos are her most prized possessions. So Angelo, or Papa Asierno, as Alice the reporter refers to him, was present during the interview, and I guess he would just watch his children and wife with pride. And Alice, she, she described Angelo as swelling up with pride like a powder pigeon, and I had to look that up. I've never heard of that. Um, and basically, the pigeon's neck will swell up. So I guess she was, I don't know, must have been like a common comparison then. And so she was saying like, Angela was watching his family with pride and was swelling with pride and swelled up like a powder pigeon. I do know that some birds during mating season, the male's Ooh. neck swell out. See, that's a good point. Yeah. It's just kind of a funny yeah, comparison. comparison. Yeah. yeah. And then powder, like like you're pouting. It sounds sad to me, but right. who knows. Angelo, I guess he would even, like, he encouraged Antonia to open up to Alice during the interview. Because like I said earlier, Antonia, she wasn't really feeling like talking about her kids, which I guess I get. Maybe, you know, she didn't want to talk about the death of 11 of her children. And obviously that's a hard thing to talk about. You know, you don't want to open up with that. So, but Antonia, she, she does kind of open up and she starts telling the reporter how she was so careful with her first 11 children and she would fuss over them and listen to all different kinds of advice. But, you know, unfortunately those children died and a lot of the, the 11 children that died, died in infancy. But with the 10 who are living now, she raises them like, quote, hearty vegetables. <laughs> Um, so Antonia, she tells Alice that she feels like American women are just too fussy about their children when they pay attention to them, if at all. And I feel like maybe Antonia took advice from American women with her first 11 children. You know, she was new to America and I think, you know, maybe people were just trying to help her out. And of course, I'm not trying to say that American women didn't know how to raise babies, but if Antonia was taking advice from American women, first of all, there's a language barrier. Antonia may have not truly understood what they were trying to tell her. And second, there is, of course, the culture gap to consider. Antonia was born and raised in Italy. Um, American customs, traditions, when it comes to child rearing, are going to be different and foreign to Antonia. And if she tries to adopt those, it may not feel natural to her. Um, but it sounds like she did get back to her roots with her other children. So she then compares her kids to American kids, saying that her kids are healthy and happy because, quote, they have been allowed to eat and sleep as they pleased. I fed them with everything they wanted and they haven't bothered me with stomach trouble or complaints like pampered children. <laughs> um, Antonia, she also discusses how her kids work with her and they help her in the garden from a young age. And again, she compares her kids to American kids by saying American parents send their kids to school where they become idlers, <laughs> which is kind of funny because school can be a little hard sometimes, you know? <laughs> Antonia then told the reporter, I believe in the Italian way of making children help their elders. They then know they have responsibilities in life. True. That's true. Yeah, exactly. Like that's 100%. But at the time of this interview, Luis, she was seven. And the reporter, Alice, describes Louise as helping her mother bunch up celery to sell the next day. So that's kind of a cute little image. Like, 
all the children like bundling up the lettuce or the celery while this uh, reporter interviews her. And Alice, it's interesting how she describes Antonia. She says that Antonia is a stout woman who, even though she's given birth to 21 children, doesn't show, quote, the lines of care and trouble that one would expect from a mother of such a huge family. But Alice then goes on to compare her to the Madonna. Alice points out that Antonia is always surrounded by her many children, and because of this, Antonia would serve the old masters of the past for a Madonna. And I think what Alice is saying here is that Antonia would have been a good model for artists slash sculptures uh, who used to create the Madonna. I believe that that Alice had a lot of respect for her. I think so too. I really do. I think she admired this family and their strength. Right. Yeah. Antonia's grandson, Ralph Asierno, described her as being a hardworking woman who was almost six feet tall with a business mind. That's really tall. It is. I mean, so she would always tell Ralph to buy real estate. Uh, and Ralph, and that's funny because later on, and we'll get into this, but Luis definitely took this advice because she ends up buying a lot of real estate. But Ralph also told a story about how his grandmother brought her St. Rocco statue to America with her and always kept a candle lit next to it. And after she died, Ralph, he kept the statue in his room with a candle and he would keep it lit 24 hours a day as well in memory of his grandmother. That's sweet. I know, that's sweet. I hope that the family still has that statue. Like, what a cool... That would be. Family um, heirloom. Heirloom, thank you. Yeah, that's really cool. So the family moved to Colorado in 1890, where they bought a farm for $200 in what was called the Bottoms. And the Bottoms was an area that became one of the first neighborhoods for Italians in Denver. And it was in lower downtown, between the train station and the South Platte River. And many of the immigrants settled there to be close to the rail yards, lumber yards, and those kind of things. And in the early 1800s, it was mainly farmland. But when the railroad came through, a lot of the farmland was sold for residential development. And by the 1890s, a lot of Italians had saved up, saved up enough money to move across the river to what became known as the actual Little Italy in Denver. And today, the area is called Union Station North and has been redeveloped. And there, there's basically just you know high-rise condos, office buildings, and commercial buildings in the area. And when the family bought the farm, their son, Salvatore, he tells a story later on about how they basically first pulled into Denver and they were driving in their, they were driving in their horse and buggy and noticed a for sale sign for a farm. And when they stopped to ask about the price, the farmer said his wife left him and he just wanted to get rid of the farm as soon as possible. So not only did the Asirnos get the farm for a decent price, they bought it for $200, which in today's money is $6,700. And today, if you bought a farm for $6,700, you got a really good deal. And another benefit to this farm um, was that the farmer, he'd already planted the crop for that year. So it was kind of moving ready, I guess you could say, for that time. And the family, they stayed there until 1913 when they sold the farm and bought a 28-acre farm in Welby, Colorado, which is just north of Denver. But later, the family ended up buying property in North Denver, which is also another name for Little Italy. The house was at 3507 Mariposa Street, and it's still there today. The house is still pretty much original. It hasn't had any gentrification done to it, which is pretty rare for that area. A lot of those old homes are being bought up and just basically torn down. Um, And the house, it was built in 1891, and it has had some major renovations. I found pictures online, and it looks like... um, (laughs) Whoever renovated it, they did leave some of the original brick exposed throughout the house. And it recently sold in the summer of two of 2021 for $755,000. Does that blow you away? Yeah, that's... I wonder what they would think. Oh, I know, right? They probably couldn't even fathom it. Right. I I mean, I can't even fathom that for that area. It's just insane. Um... It, and so basically, you know, when the Cyrano's bought the house in 1913, they paid $1,700. So in today's money, $1,700 is $52,000. So Luis, she was born on July 24th, 1903 in Denver, Colorado. And she grew up in the Little Italy portion of Denver. She spent most of her childhood living in the house on 3507 Mariposa. But she did spend some time at the family farm in Welby, Colorado, too. And she attended school at the Webster School in Little Italy. And if you remember the episode about George Noche, 
I talked about how his how his sister Lillian was a teacher and eventually the principal of Webster School. That's kind of a cool connection there. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of information on Luis's early life. Really, I couldn't find anything until Luis eloped with Angela, which is now, I guess, we'll, where we'll pick back up on the story. So, after the whole debacle at the train station, um, where her family comes rushing in to stop the marriage, Angelo, he actually ended up getting arrested. Um, and if you remember, he took off when Luis's parents and brothers showed up at the train station, but the police, they did find him. Uh, he was in downtown Denver, and they arrested him on perjury charges. So apparently, um, he took an oath at the courthouse where they got married, stating that Luis was 18 when they applied for the marriage certificate. And if you remember, she was actually 16. <laughs> so whoopsies. <laughs> um, even Luis was being held in the city jail for juvenile delinquency. And her mother, Antonia, swore she would have the marriage annulled. But I couldn't really find anything in the newspaper stating that the charges were actually filed. But regardless, Angelo and Luis, they stayed married and started their lives together. So a little background on Angelo. He was born in Molise, Italy in 1892. He came to America when he was one year old. His family settled in the Denver area as well. And in 1911, Angelo married a Mary... Okay, so here's the deal. My mom and I have re-recorded this portion like 17 times, and neither of us can figure out how to say Angelo's first wife's last name. So her first name was Mary, um, and her last name is spelled N-U-O-S-C-I. And I can't I can't find it online, and I, I'm just gonna be honest, I don't know how to pronounce that. So if anybody out there knows, um, I'll post this last name on Instagram, and if you know how to pronounce it, let me know, because I am at a total loss. So I'm just gonna skip that part with her name and <laughs> move on. But Angelo and Mary, they bought a house in Little Italy and they had two children, Helen and Josephine. Like I said earlier though, um, she did pass away in November of 1918 and she was only 25. I'm not really sure what she passed away from. It was pretty young though. So, so a little over a year after Mary's death, Angelo and Luis eloped. And honestly, I think the fact that Angelo was married and had two kids was probably the main problem her family had with Angelo. But Angelo and Luis, they went on to have two children of their own. Lorraine Adeline Laveo, she was born December 1920, and Albert Daniel Laveo, and he was born March 1922. I couldn't find the day he was born. So the family lived in a house in Little Italy, and it's funny because it's actually the same street that you grew up on for a little while. That uh, is a funny isn't coincidence. That funny? Yeah. Um, Raritan. Right. Was right. it Avenue or Street? I'm not for sure. Raritan. I think it's Raritan Street. I don't know either. Yeah, we'll have I'm to not look positive that up. on that. Yeah. Yeah, so when Mom's dad got out of the service, that was uh, one of the first houses that he bought was on Raritan. Right. So that's how we're all connected, probably. The probably. Start, maybe? Yeah, that might have been the kickoff, like where yeah. everybody kind of met. Um, because then everybody moved, even Lorraine, uh, Luis oh, well, and no. Angelo. They knew each other back before. Oh, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, they knew each other before. Oh, that's, yeah. Cause that could have been how he bought the house there. That's true. Because maybe Luis, uh, and we'll get into all of this, but uh, yeah, and so that, that could be it. That makes sense. And Angelo, he worked at the Denver Sewer Pipe and Clay Company, while Luis, she contributed to the household by bootlegging. So according to an article from the Denver Post dated December 8th, 1922, Luis's stepdaughter Josephine answered the door one day to find federal agents standing there. But little Josephine didn't know that they were agents. She actually thought that they were just two regular guys there to buy moonshine. So she invited them in and she was the oldest child at that point and she was home with all the, the little kids. Uh, so she had the federal agents come in and she put her little baby brother in a baby chair and went to get the moonshine. The agents asked her if her parents were home and she informed them that it was just her and her siblings. And like I said earlier, Josephine, she was watching the three younger ones. So she went ahead and told them that she would sell them the moonshine. And it's crazy because she, she knew how, she knew the whole process. She went and got the gallon, after she got the gallon jug of moonshine, probably from the basement, uh, she got a pencil and a paper and started adding up the cost of the moonshine. And so at this point, the agents stopped Josephine and told her that they were, they were federal agents and they then proceeded to search her house. And in the basement, they found a 40 gallon moonshine still and 50 gallons of mash. And I had to look up mash. I didn't know what that was. I had no idea. Did you, do you know what mash is? I know it's a product of um, 
alcohol making. Okay. But yeah. I couldn't tell you what it is. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't even know that. I had no idea. So just in case nobody else knows, I did look up the definition. It is the process of combining a mix of ground grains, typically malted barley, with other grains such as corn, rye, or wheat. So the agents then asked Josephine about the quote, business they run out of their home. And apparently Josephine told them that she thought the business was, quote, all right. And so I think she means on the up and up, basically. And she also told them that she was feeling anxious because they might be missing cells and they need the money. <laughs> so she's like, hey, you're interrupting my business with all this shenanigans, get out of here. <laughs> and so when they asked Josephine if she ever had, if she had ever made cells before or seen her father make cells, she refused to comment. And the police reported that Josephine was the youngest bootlegger they had ever encountered. And, and how old was she? I was just gonna say, I don't know if I mentioned how old she was. She was seven years old. Oh my. I know. And she was home with the three younger siblings selling moonshine. That's scary. That is scary. And I think this was, what What year was this? Um, 1922. So, I mean, what a, what a different world, huh? Right. So the author of the article, he describes Josephine in an interesting way. And honestly, I'm just gonna, going to quote it because I don't think I could sum it up in my own words. So it goes, quote, the daughter of Angelo Laveo, possessing all the noted beauty of Italian children of that age. I don't know. It just seems odd to describe a seven-year-old this way, like in the situation she's in with selling the moonshine. And now the reason I said that Louise was the bootlegger of the family is because Angelo, he actually ended up getting arrested for the incident with Josephine, but Louise came to his defense. And in an article that came out two days after the feds visited the home, Luis claims that Angelo had no idea she was making and or selling moonshine out of their house. <laughs> now, I don't really necessarily believe this, but <laughs> Luis was trying to save Angelo from getting fired from his job. So, I mean, how do you not know? A 40, what was it, a 40 gallon, like moonshine making machine down there? <laughs> and the seven year old is selling it. <laughs> Exactly. Like the seven-year-old's not going to come tell her dad, I sold seven bottles today. <laughs> so the authorities, they actually did end up letting Angelo go. And they arrested Luis, who was 19 at this time. And her bond was set at $1,000, which in today's money is about 18000 That's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. Um, and she pleaded guilty to the charges and claimed that she had to sell moonshine to pay off the family's debts. And so Louise went on to tell the reporter that Angelo made good money their first year of marriage, but then he got sick somehow and was not able to make as much money. She talks about the $295 grocery bill they have, the furniture bill, the clothing bill, and doctor's bills, and how she was tired of collectors taking Angelo's paycheck. So she took matters into her own hands, I guess. And I mean, she was a mom to four kids who were under the age of seven and she basically saw selling moonshine as an opportunity to make some money um, on her own. And apparently this all began when she met a peddler who offered to sell her a wash boiler still for I don't know how much money, but she ended up buying this still from the guy and agreed to pay him $10 a month. Well, Luis couldn't pay the last payment and she thinks that this is actually how the feds found out about her selling moonshine. She thinks the peddler turned her in basically out of, out of revenge for not paying her last payment. And in an interesting article that came out, um, they actually refer to Luis as a strikingly pretty 19 year old mother who defends her family, but will seek revenge on the peddler who turned her into the feds. So that could be bad. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of gets, honestly, it kind of gets a little choppy here with her, with Luis's story. Um, I found a lot in her younger years and then it kind of gets, I just couldn't find a whole lot. So I'm just going to kind of go through basically a timeline of Louise's story based off of the newspaper articles I could find. Um, in 1924, Louise's sister Rosa passed away after an operation from appendicitis and she was only 35 years old and had nine children. And I think this was extremely hard on Louise. And I say this because for years after Rosa's death, Louise would buy a spot in the newspapers on the anniversary of Rosa's death. And it's basically, 
it's basically like a dedication. She would put, um, she would basically like a memorial. A memorial. Thank you. Yes, that's what I was trying to think about. So yeah, she would take out a memorial, like snippet in the paper for her sister. And one of these um, dedications from 1930 read, "In loving memory of my dear sister Rosa Piccoli, uh, who passed away six years ago." And while she lies in peaceful sleep, her memory we shall always keep, sadly missed by her sister Louise. So I think, you know, that was a little hard on her. An interesting situation happened to the family in the summer of 1930 when all of Angelo and Louise's kids were exposed to smallpox. Uh, so what happened was a gentleman from Texas moved up to Colorado and was staying in a hotel when he contracted smallpox. And the city ended up quarantining him to a small shack slash chicken coop. And it was located at 2915 Lawrence Street in Denver. And the Laveos, they lived at 2929 Lawrence Street, so just a little ways down the road. And so to set the scene, this shack was not in an isolated area. There were houses all around. In fact, the Denver Post described it as, quote, the place was stuffy, dingy, and unsanitary. It made no difference, it, it made no difference that the houses crowded it closely on either side that children played about in the weed-ridden lot in front of it. And some of these children were the Laveo kids. And so <laughs> the city apparently just drops this guy off there in the middle of the night and nailed a sign to the door that said smallpox. Can you imagine waking up? And, and actually the author, the newspaper talks about this. Like the next day the neighbors woke up and noticed the sign. Can you imagine waking up and a smallpox sign nailed to a chicken coop? I That's just nuts. Um, mm. And knowing somebody's inside of it also. Yeah, exactly. Like the, <clears throat> that somebody was just dropped off in the middle of the night and thrown in this chicken coop. And, and you'd think they'd have to warn people, too. Because smallpox is no joke. And how, how do they know he's going to stay there? Exactly. Like, who's, yeah, he could have left right away. Ugh, that's crazy. And I guess I, I did read in the article that the city found one of his friends or something who had agreed to bring him food. So... I mean, but still, like, how do you know he's going to stay there? So, like I said, the next day the neighbors, they noticed this and were concerned because the house was so close to theirs. And a lot of the neighborhood children had been playing in the front yard of the shack. So, I mean, it had to have been, like, just some abandoned place. Um, and there's a really cool picture in the article. It is it is a little hard to see, but it shows three of the four Laveo kids. Josephine is in the photo, and you can see her really well. And I'll post the picture to Instagram. So the next summer in 1931, the Denver Post put out an article celebrating Luisa's parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And it talked about how they came from Italy, they had 21 children, but only nine are surviving, or nine are living now because um, Rosa no. passed away. So. so the article also touched upon how their children are all married and happy and have families of their own. So Luisa's parents, they also told um, the reporter who was doing this article that they've read the Denver Post, you know, for as long as they can remember, but now that they're getting older, they have to have their children read it to them. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of sweet. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, two months later, on October 6, 1931, the Denver Post reported that Luis's father, uh, they called him Ralph, but, you know, his middle name was Raphael, so he must have been going by Ralph at that point, uh, had passed away at his home. And for years after this, Louise put out two dedications, one for her father and one for her sister. So to get back to Louise and Angelo, um, their marriage had some rough times. In fact, on Friday, March 13th, 1925, Angelo was arrested for breaking Louise's nose. So the Denver Post stated that Angelo's pretty Italian wife broke his heart, so he broke her nose. Um, so I'm assuming maybe she had an affair. That's why she broke his heart i don't i don't know they didn't elaborate either so uh, i'm not sure what led up to the incident but the judge told told angelo quote i'll teach you to become more cautious on friday the 13th and angelo responded by saying and this is a quote in the newspaper that's no make -a any difference and so i don't think that this judge maybe understood that the 13th isn't unlucky to Italians. <laughs> so I'm sure Angelo was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but Angelo was charged a fine of $10 and was released the next day. Uh, but even after all of that, Luis still went to bat for Angelo. And in October of 1925, he was arrested this time for selling and delivering whiskey to a downtown hotel. 
And Luis went to the court hearing with Angelo and asked for him to not have a long sentence since they have a family to support. So the judge allowed Angelo to plead guilty and only gave him 90 days in jail. So he gets 90 days in jail for selling and delivering alcohol, but one day for breaking his wife's nose. <laughs> Seems a little backwards. In 1932, Luis and Angelo were once again busted for having moonshine. Apparently, the feds were absolutely certain that the Leveos were holding moonshine in their home. And two agents, Ray Humphreys and Stanley Mouse? Moss? I don't really know how to pronounce it. Uh, raided their home multiple times but found nothing. But the two agents decided they would give it one more shot. And on March 1st, 1932, they went into the home and just tore it apart. When Humphreys and Moss got to the family's phonograph player, they pulled out a few bottles of moonshine. But this time, Angelo took the fall um, and was booked for violating the state prohibition law. And he actually ended up serving eight months in jail for this. And 1932 was not a good year for the Leveos or for the federal agents that were involved in busting the Leveos for having moonshine. And here's why. This is a little, a little rough, just a forewar forewarning. An article came out in the Denver Post on December 7th, 1932, with the headline, Dry Agent Accused of Making Love to Get Liquor Evidence. Well, I bet you I can definitely tell you whose side of the story this is going to come from. Exactly. Yep. Um, so that dry agent apparently made love to young Josephine Leveo, who was barely 17 at the time. Makes my stomach turn. What I could gather from the article was that a few months earlier in September, the dry agent approached Josephine and seduced her and convinced her to sell him two bottles of whiskey. The making love comment, it's, it's so disturbing. I mean, and, and I, I kept thinking to myself, okay, did that have a different meaning in 19, what was this, 1932? 1932. Did it have a different meaning? Well, that's why I was saying, whose side of the story is this? Definitely is his for saying, well, you know, she wanted to make love. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, it's crazy because he should be in so much trouble for this. Um, but Josephine, she was still arrested at the age of 17 and pled guilty to the charges. And I searched everywhere for more information on this. I searched in our Colorado State Archives. I searched all the newspaper article databases I could. Um, but I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find the guy's name. I couldn't find if he was ever investigated further or arrested. Um, there's just, I, I couldn't find anything out there. But I, I'll keep looking and if I find anything, um, I'll do an update. But just, she went to jail. She went to jail. For yeah. selling. For selling, exactly. But nothing was ever reported again about what happened with this. No, I'm sure that was all swept under the carpet. Oh, of course, for sure. I mean, he he got what he was looking for, which was the moonshine. I just hope Josephine was okay. I mean, that's that's a lot. She's 17 years old, and she's she had an interesting life leading up to that already. I mean, at seven years old, they caught her selling alcohol. So, so a year later, in 1933, Angelo and Luis were arrested for fighting in a cafe. So the newspaper article, it describes it as, quote, free for all, knock down and drag out fight. <laughs> and at this point, Angelo, he's in his 40s. And Louise is in her, Louise is 30 at this point. <laughs> so they're just going full out brawl in a cafe. Um, so this was a cafe downtown and it was called Irene's Cafe. And one woman, Blanche Oates, and two men, Earl Williams and Albert Rhodes, were actually taken to the hospital. Uh, the two men, they were actually arrested later for drunk drunkenness and disturbance after they were released from the hospital. And Angela and Luis, they were arrested as well and given a court date. I couldn't really find out what happened or what caused the big fight, but I did find some interesting tidbits on Blanche that I kind of want to share because... It's a little interesting. Um, at one point, she was arrested for hitting her brother over the head with a milk bottle. She was also hit by a truck and broke most of her fingers. It was just this little like, and I don't really see this in newspapers anymore, but they would have like hospital visits or hospital, like if an ambulance had to come take somebody. And it just said, Blanche Oates, hit by truck, broken fingers. So I, <laughs> I don't, I'm not really sure what happened there, but. 
Um, and she was also arrested for drunk driving. Apparently, there were four people in her front seat, and they were all drunk. And the police saw her, like, weaving in and out of traffic. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe the fight started with Blanche. <laughs> she just seemed a little like a wild card. <laughs> so, like I said, I... I'm skipping a few years here in between because I just couldn't find a whole lot of information on Louise. Uh, but on March 20th, 1935, the matriarch of the Asirno family passed away. Antonia, Louise's mother, was 69, was 69 years old when she passed away at her home after a short illness. The Denver Post, I, I think they, they really like to write articles about Antonia because they even wrote an article about her death. The headline read, Woman Merchant of Denver is Dead. They talked about how she came here from Italy and managed a vegetable store along with raising a lot of kids. And Antonia's funeral service was held at Mount Carmel Church and she was buried at Mount Olivet. Antonia always said that when she died, she knew the skies would be dark and it would be extremely windy. And after her funeral, when they were taking her body out of the church, her children and grandchildren noticed that the skies were dark and there was a strong wind. And I found this story on Ancestry.com, um, and it looks like it was kind of like a family memoir, so probably a story that the family retells often. After her mother's death, Louise put out dedications for her as well in the newspaper every year. And there's not a whole lot on Louise and the family after Antonia's death in 1935. Josephine married her husband, Nicholas Harold, or Lorraine married her husband, John Levnick, in 1937, and their other daughter, Helen, married Peter Murphy in 1940. And in 1941, their son Albert married his wife, Josephine. Throughout these years, Louise started purchasing properties around the Denver area, and she owned quite a few that she rented out that she rented out or let family live in. In fact, my great grandmother rented a house from her for 38 years, but we'll get into that later. And on July 24th, 1947, Angelo passed away in Denver. And it's kind of crazy because July 24th is Louise's birthday, so it's kind of sad. Um, I couldn't find any info on why he passed, but he was, he was young. I mean, he was only 55. Uh, the following year, Louise remarried. She married a George N. Porter, and together they kept purchasing properties, and Louise opened up her own business. She opened up a bell bond business, and I can't say for sure, but I would bet she was one of the first women in the state of Colorado to do that. That doesn't seem like a business that many women would open back then. Right, yeah. It was pretty male dominated. I agree. Yeah, so that's kind of it's kind of a cool little fact. I mean, I can't verify for sure, but I would bet money. In fact, by 1950, the Denver Post was referring to her as one of the veterans in the bond business, and she was actually one of nine approved bondsmen to work in the city by a local judge. And actually, interestingly, out of those um, nine approved bondsmen, three of them were Italians, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were Louise, of course, and even though she married George Porter, she continued to use uh, the last name Laveo whenever it came to her bonds business. Sadly, on October 20th, 1955, Albert, Louise's son, passed away. He was in the hospital when he passed away, and um, he was actually an electrician, and he worked for the Belmont Electric Company. Do you remember that? Mm -mm, no, no, I don't. It was in Arvada, so oh. maybe that was... And Arvada is just a kind of like a suburb of Denver. Um, but yeah, so he, he worked for the Belmont Electric Company, and he was actually stricken while at work. And that's all the obituary said, so I, I don't know. I'm assuming he was electrocuted. That's kind of what it sounds like. Um, right. And so he spent a little bit of time in the hospital, but he did pass away. Um, Albert, in his younger years, he was a well-known amateur boxer in the Denver area, and he also served in the Army during World War II. He was a member of the American Legion Club and the Men's Club at St. Philomena's. Um, he had four children when he passed away, and I'm sure this was extremely hard on Luis and the family. He was, he was so young. What was he, 30? He was only 33, I believe, when he passed away. Luis and her husband, George, they continued to buy properties and run the Belbon business for quite a few years. George passed away in 1982, and Louise continued to live in the Denver area until she passed away on September 6, 1996. Okay, so earlier I mentioned how my great-grandmother rented a house from Louise for 38 years. Now, I, I have patched, actually, honestly, Mom and I, we've kind of patched together the story that we're about to tell you based on family history and family stories, and also some of the financial property records that I found of Louise's. 
So with that being said, I can't verify that every aspect is true, but I don't know. Mom and I, we just kind of know in our guts that we're on the right track. So my great-grandmother, Mary Weisenberger, yes, a German, um, (laughs) we call her, well, I call her Grandma Mary, and Mom called her Nanny. Nanny. (laughs) Yeah, Nanny. (laughs) Um, So she married my great-grandfather, Clyde Rocco Smalldone, in Denver in 1923. And without getting into too much of our family history and veering off of Louise's story, Clyde and Mary's marriage was not the greatest, and it only lasted for 12 years. But the marriage did produce two amazing children, my grandfather, my mom's dad, John David Smaldone, and his little brother, Clyde Rocco Smaldone. And like Louise's family, ours were in the bootlegging business as well. (laughs) Um, Another connection. Another connection to Louise, exactly. Uh, And I'm not so sure how much Grandma Mary participated in the bootlegging, but her husband Clyde did for sure. Wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think she was in it as much. Um, And they were all, like, Clyde and Mary and their children and Luis and Angelo and their children, they were all around the same age. And that included their kids. They were all pretty close to the same age. Um, And they also lived in the Little Italy area. Many years after my grandfather passed away, mom, she actually ended up talking to one of my grandpa's acquaintances. They told her how um, my grandfather's father, Clyde, had the children delivering moonshine. And so I would bet that my grandfather and his little brother, they probably ran moonshine with the Laveo kids. I would also agree with that, too. Yeah. Everything was so hush-hush and not talked about, but... I I really feel that. I do, too. I completely agree. I can almost see them, like, riding their bicycles down, like, 38th Avenue or something, (laughs) you know, with, like, moonshine in their bags or something. And they did. That's how they delivered was on the bicycle. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, you know that they probably all loaded the kids up at the same time, and they all just dispersed on their bikes. Right. It's kind of, I mean, it's not the greatest image, but it's kind of a cool image to think about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But sadly, Clyde Rocco Jr., He passed away when he was 10 years old. And so that was my grandfather's youngest brother. And the family story goes that Clyde was outside playing in the yard. We don't know. We don't really know what they were doing. No, I never ever heard um, they were just outside in the yard. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, they were little kids. I mean, Clyde was 10, Grandpa was 12. So who knows what they were doing. Um, and Clyde ended up falling and he landed on a sprinkler and these sprinklers in 1930s, they were massive, just metal, the steel sprinklers. So they were, they were pretty big. Um, and unfortunately when he fell, he broke his collarbone and strangely this turned into cancer. And I don't really know if it was cancer. Um, it seems like a, a lot of fades got diagnosed as cancer back then. But uh, Grandma Mary, she ended up taking Clyde Jr. all over. Was it Boston or New York? Boston. Boston. To the Mayo Clinic. To the Mayo Clinic, yeah. So she, she took him on, the, on a train, wasn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, just basically trying to, to cure him and because um, they thought it was cancer. And it might have been cancer. I don't know. But it just seems maybe it was an infection because he broke his collarbone i don't know i don't remember what the um death certificate says it does say something like a mass so maybe maybe he had cancer and they didn't realize it until he broke his collarbone cuz there does say something like i actually just looked at it a couple of days ago and it does reference cancer on the death certificate yeah that's, so but like you said Things were diagnosed as that when nothing else could be found. Exactly. Or knowing. Yeah. So it's it's really, it's hard to tell. But unfortunately, he did end up passing away in 1937. So a year before Clyde Jr. passed away, my great-grandparents, so Grandma Mary and Clyde Sr., they divorced. And I'm sure, you know, between the bootlegging and Clyde Jr. getting hurt, that's probably what contributed to the divorce. But like Mom said earlier, it was kind of a hush-hush thing nobody talked about um that right. era of our family right. <laughs> so so you didn't ask questions um this was one thing that we just didn't bring up in our family everybody kind of knew the story but especially it when... wasn't something that was talked about openly exactly it was almost like everybody knew yep but you just don't talk about it you don't talk about it yeah it's like we all knew the story but especially around great grandma right she really didn't want to talk about it um, 
And that even goes... Grandpa used to really push that too. Yeah. Do not ask questions to your grandma. About Clyde. Right. And I think that went for Clyde Jr. and Clyde Sr. Right. She didn't want to talk about either of them. Right. Yeah. Um, And so we didn't. We never did. (laughs) Unfortunately. Unfortunately. And, you know, it's something that I wish I would have pressed for, you know, press people like my grandfather when he was alive. But, I mean, I was 11 when he passed, so... Right. Um, Because I think he probably would have told some more. Yeah, I wish that I would have done that. Yeah. I I should have been the one that did do that. No. (laughs) I mean, it's one of those things that we all, like, look back at. Um, And especially if he wasn't around his mom, he probably would have opened up and told more stories. Right. But... Okay, but anyways, let's tie all of this back to Louise. So after Grandma Mary and Clyde Sr. got a divorce, Grandma Mary ended up running her own seamstress business, and she moved into a cute little brick home. Out, this was outside of the Little Italy area, and she lived in that home for 38 years. So a few years back when I ran across the articles about Louise, I started researching her, and I found all of the records for the properties that she owned, and one of the deeds was the house that Grandma Mary lived in. I actually think I called you, and I was like, what was Grandma Mary's address? Right. Yeah. And I actually always thought she owned the house. Yeah. I actually did not know she rented the house. I think everybody thought she owned right. it. Right. And But there again... You just didn't talk about things like that. It was all hush hush stuff, and so I was actually shocked. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Because I remember calling you up and giving you the address, and you were like, "Yeah, that's Grandma Mary's address." And I told you who owned it, and you were shocked that she, she, because I mean, she lived there for thirty-eight years. Right. <laughs> so it was... It's crazy. Um, and so, so what Mom and I think is. Um, Luis and Grandma Mary, they knew each other back in the day when they lived in the Little Italy area. Um, They both had ties to the bootlegging. Their children probably ran moonshine together. Um, Grandma Mary was married to an Italian in Little Italy. And I think once Clyde died and Grandma Mary divorced Clyde Sr., Luis probably felt for her, you know? Right. And another part of that, too, is going back to... um... Us growing up as kids. Yeah. Living on Raritan next to Louise. Exactly. Yeah. And there, then grandma with her house. Yep. There's got to be, like I said, we're, this is our gut feeling, um, but it's it just makes so much sense. There's That's too many coincidences. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I I have that gut feeling, too. <laughs> and so, um, so Grandma Mary, she lived in, in that house for 38 years, and... The rent was never raised on right. her. I do know that. You do know that, yeah. Like, And you probably thought it was just her mortgage, you know? Right. But yeah, so Luis, I mean, and my grandma, so Grandma Mary, she died in 95, and she lived in that house until 95. Yeah, and that's when I found out she didn't own the house. Ooh, well, that's right, when she yeah. died. That's yeah. when you found out that she didn't own the house. And then when you found out that Luis owned it. It all started making uh, sense. Right, yeah. And the one next door. And yes, exactly. So, so Luis, I'm glad you brought that up because Luis owned the house right next door to my grandma Mary's, and mom's family or my family, our family, uh, lived in that periodically throughout the years. Right. You know, just whenever somebody needed a place to live, um, grandpa lived there. Right. Your bro- a few of your brothers lived there. Right. Your sister Kathy right. lived there. Um, and like I said, the houses were right next door to each other. So, I think, like I said, I think Louise felt for Grandma Mary after Clyde died, after the divorce. And, you know, I'm sure Louise had guilt feelings, too, of having her kids run moonshine. Um, Josephine, that that whole debacle there, that's a right. lot. Right, that was, that was a, a sad situation. Right. And so I think she helped her out, and she let her live in that house. Um, and it was, a, it was a cute little house. They had, there's pictures of mom and all of her, mom's one of seven siblings, um, having family dinners there, and uh, and there must have been some deep feelings because that later when we find out that she rented it all that time for such a cheap price, yeah, you know who does that for thirty eight years? For thirty eight years, you don't raise the rent. I mean, because you're talking. So Grandma Mary moved in there from in nineteen fifty eight, right? And then to ninety five, 
and you don't raise the rent at all. I mean, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, like I say, there's the family photos of, you know, everybody having family dinner there. And um, <clears throat> there's this lady in the photo that we're not really sure who she is. Um, but an interesting tidbit. So Luis's middle name is Alice. And later on, her, her last husband, George, his last name was Porter. Well, mom always remembers a lady coming around uh, named Alice, but you thought the last name was Potter. Potter. Yeah, her name was Alice Potter. Yeah. To us. Exactly. But when you're a kid, Porter, Potter, right. it yeah. kind of sounds the same. Right, and you probably didn't hear the last name very often. Oh, no, exactly. You know, so you hear it once or twice, and then that's whatever's stuck in your brain is what it, you yeah. got. And, and I kids always are... got Potter. Yeah, kids are going to go with Potter. I mean, it just sounds more, you know, like something a kid would say. So... Again, we don't know for sure if it was her or not, but Alice Potter, Louise, Alice Porter, it kind of makes sense. Right. And then, I mean, they were obviously friends. She rented the house for 38 years. I just have to keep going back to that. And why was she always there? Why was she always there? Yeah. yeah. So Exactly. And mom remembers her as Alice. And maybe Louise went by Alice to, you know, her close friends. Maybe her close friends called her Alice and maybe business acquaintances called her um, Louise. Who knows? It's hard to say. Right. When yeah. Everything published about her, that's her real name, so that's what they put down. Exactly, yeah. Maybe her first name. name. Or her first name, yeah. But friends and family called her Alice, so. Yeah, and so, you know, with Alice being around and in the pictures, I mean, you probably remember her, you know, quite a bit. Yeah. I remember one story that was told that Alice's husband. So George. Yeah. Mm-hmm was out in the backyard of their house mowing the yard and he got his finger cut off from the lawnmower. Oh, jeez. And then he came running in and so Alice had to run out to the backyard, find his finger <laughs> and call an ambulance or she took him. I'm not for sure, but the reason I always remember this is because I always think how gross that was of having to go find this chopped off <laughs> finger. <laughs> and being a kid, you know, you're just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's really creepy. And then like thinking of like, to chop a full finger off, that had been a lot of blood too. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny the stories you remember when you're a kid. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so pretty interesting. But, uh, you know, I fell in love with the story of Louise and... Um, just continue to fall in love with her, the more, you know, mom and I kind of started putting two and two together with the connection of our family. So um, there's a lot of photos that I'll post up on uh, the Instagram page. I've got a few of Louise, um, her her children, her husband, and her parents. Um, and then the one, of course, of the kids in front of the smallpox chicken coop thing. And uh, I've got a couple of fun photos of mom and I recording today. So um, thank you for recording with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, that, that was, was a great episode. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll do it again for sure, especially with the Denver ones. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so looking good. forward to it. <laughs> and really quick before we close off, I just want to shout out a book. Uh, it's titled Italy in Colorado, Family Histories from Denver and Beyond. And it's by Alyssa Zoller. And it's a great book. It's got, um, it, it, you know, it talks about the Italians in Colorado and mainly in Denver, but, you know, in the surrounding areas. And it gives history of the areas that they lived in. It's just a great book full of wonderful stories. So just wanted to shout that out really quick. And I hope you enjoyed listening to the story of Luis Cirno. And I hope you come back to listen to more stories about Italian Americans. See you next time.